exactly be described as a hockey state, and the team knew it would have to put together a good lineup to get the people off the beaches and into the arena. They drafted well, and with Coach Bert Olmsted at the helm, most sports writers were predicting the club would finish near the top of the newly created West Division. But they didn't. A weak offense and defense that was full of holes resulted in the Seals finishing in last place. Northern Californians stayed on the beach. For the 1968-69 season, there were a lot of changes. New owners took over the club, and an aggressive campaign was started to attract fans. Fred Glover was named as the new coach, and along with a front office staff that included people like Frank Selke and present New York Islanders GM Bill Torrey, the club began to sign young, talented players. The results were immediate. Keeps it in the zone as it stopped right on the line. Hickey behind the net. Out front. Shot to go. Ted Hampton jammed it by Chambers. And the Seals have come back for a second time to tie. That's Rick Smith. Intercepted by Lawton. Gets it in the corner to Eamon. Here's Robert's shot. Goal! Three to two Seals. The Seals finished in second place that season, and Fred Glover was named Coach of the Year. However, in the playoffs, the Seals were knocked out in the first round by Los Angeles in seven games, and the next season, well, pretty well the same story. But it seemed that hockey was catching on in the Bay Area, and the average attendance had climbed to 6,200 per game. The future looked bright, but again, changes were on the way. Shortly before the start of the 1970-71 season, Charles O'Finley, flamboyant and controversial owner of the soon-to-be world champion Oakland A's baseball club, bought the team. Among his first actions was to introduce new uniforms, a little more in line with his tastes. He also introduced a new innovation like players' names on the back of their jerseys. Well, the important things out of the way, Finley's front office then began to wheel and deal. They started a habit that would last until 1974. They traded away their first-round draft choice to get experienced players. They dealt with the Montreal Canadiens and got Ernie Hickey and Chris Odlifson. The Canadians took the draft pick and got Guy Lafleur. The Seals didn't duplicate the A's championship ways that year. They finished in last place. Charlie Finley decided it was time for some changes. He bought the team white skates. They didn't prove too popular with the players. Finley also hired a new coach, Vic Stasiak, formerly of the Philadelphia Flyers. I think when fans are paying five, six, up to twelve dollars in playoffs for a ticket, they're entitled to the very, very best that you can give them. In the 1971-72 season, the Seals fans got their money's worth. The team, which the year before had a 2-37 record on the road, won their first three away games, including a stunning 2-0 shutout of Boston. In the nets for that game was the Seals' new rookie sensation, Gilles Wallach. The players like Carol Vadney, Stan Weir, Ivan Boldrev, and Craig Patrick, the Seals were once again playoff contenders. The team's publicity department went to work bringing out local celebrities to the games. Oakland Raiders quarterback Kenny Stabler and ace pitcher Rolly Fingers, just a few of those taking part in the promotions. During one game, a female streaker dashed across the ice. Attendance once again rose. Although the Seals continued to set club records and had big victories against teams like Montreal, there was a growing disenchantment with the way Finley was running the team. That season, California barely missed the playoffs by losing key games the last week of the regular season. The next year brought the formation of the World Hockey Association, and the Seals were the worst-hit team. Nine players jumped to the new league. The following two seasons, the Seals finished dead last in the standings. With open hostility by the players towards Finley and the growing list of coaches, the league decided it was time to step in. In February 1974, the NHL took over the club. Marshall Johnston, a popular veteran player, was named coach, and the Finley influences were quickly erased. The Seals got their black skates again, and new Pacific blue and California gold uniforms. The club once again had first-round draft choices, and new players like Dennis Maru, Al McAdam, and Charlie Simmer joined the team. The league ran the Seals for one year before it was bought for the 1975-76 season by San Francisco hotel owner Mal Swig, who had previously owned the club when they were in the Western Hockey League. With new owners and new management, attendance was once again on the upswing. Soon there was an average of 6,700 vocal Seals fans at every game, being led by a man who would later become North America's most famous cheerleader. The man, Crazy George. Why do you cheer for the Seals? Because they're great! <laughs> they're great! I love the Seals! They're a good team. Nobody believes it yet, but it's the most exciting game you can't believe when you get out there on the ice. Come and see it, you'll, you'll believe it! The Seals fans believed, and owner Swig believed in the city of San Francisco. 
which said it would build a new 16,000 seat arena across the bay. He said the bigger arena was necessary for the financial success of the team. On April 4th, 1976, the California Seals played their last game of the season against the Los Angeles Kings, winning 5-2. That summer, the proposed new arena fell through, and after nine years in Oakland, the Seals moved to Ohio and became the Cleveland Barons. The Barons didn't fare much better, and after two years, were merged into the Minnesota North Stars. The California Seals had become just a memory. Greg Musselman, ITV Sports.